Scotland's meeting of the Scrutiny Committee external. It's uh, the 6th of October and I'm Brian Perry. I'm the Democratic Services Manager. And just, just to say before we start the business that we've had apologies from the, the convener, uh, Councillor Brown, who's, who's unfortunately unwell. So the first piece of business this morning is to ask the committee if they want to nominate somebody who can chair the meeting today. And I think, as explained at a previous meeting, it should be somebody from the opposition side. Hey, could I nominate Councillor Kelly? I'll Kelly is going to, going to chair this morning's meeting. Um, maybe the first thing I can do, convener, then is just to, to go through apologies on the agenda. So obviously we have Councillor Brown, as I indicated. We also have Councillor Aitchison, unfortunately, is unable to join us, and uh, Councillor Forrest, um, similarly, um, has, has COVID, unfortunately, and is, is quite unwell, so he's not able to join us. Um, we have in the room Councillor, Councillor Binney, Councillor Kelly and Councillor Redmond, and online we have Councillor David Balfour and Councillor Anne Ritchie. So if you're happy, we just go through the rest of the business, convener. Do you want me to take them through declarations of interest? Yeah, please. So the first item of business uh, after apologies <laughs> is declarations of interest. And at this stage, just asking members if they've got any financial or non-financial interest they have in any of the business that's coming forward, ask them to, to declare now if they could. I don't see any hands or any comments, so we'll take that as none. The next item convener then is uh, the minute of the last meeting, which is there for approval of the correct record. If maybe do that first, and then have any, any questions? Yes. Are the committee happy to approve? Approve. I've, oh, sorry. I've, sorry, I've got a oh. question on okay. minutes. Sure. I think at the last meeting, if I remember, there was a request for, from myself for a map style document that outlined the community learning projects in each ward. Uh, I believe all the councillors felt that would be beneficial. That has not been received yet. Uh, thanks, Councillor Benny, if I may. Um, yeah, I've been in dialogue with, I think it was um, Mark Meakin and Jennifer Kerr at the last meeting, and um, they, they're able to produce that. It's unfortunate we haven't been able to get it to you yet, but that's something I believe we can get to you quite soon. And I uh, just apologise for the delay. Thanks, Brian. Um, then can we just move it as an accurate? Yep. Uh, Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. The next item convener is the role and action log, which is just shows items of business that the committee have asked to come forward to future meetings. There's only one at the current stage. It's a report from the Health and Social Care Partnership that we looked at in February. And the committee at that time asked the partnership when it reports next, which is a, a yearly report. Um, to provide, them, provide information on recommendations made by the Joint Staff Forum and actions taken to implement and monitor the recommendations. And the comments from um, the Health and Social Care Partnership were that they will bring that to the next update meeting and uh, next update report, beg your pardon, and the next update report is actually due at our next meeting in November. So their report will include that information. Thanks. Okay with that? Thank you. The next item of business is probably the, the first of the substantive reports, and it's a following the pound report, following the public pound report, uh, looking at the public protection area. I'm just give me a sec to turn to this. So these are organisations <coughs> that the public funds. Uh, on the basis that they're able to provide services that we could not readily be provided by the council or have not been provided by council in the past. You'll see from the report uh, committee that there are two organisations, Sacro Youth Justice, who are funded to the tune of £78,000 a year and committed to ending abuse, who are funded to £175,000 a year. There's two monitoring reports and I think maybe the best way to deal with this is to ask uh, Gail McIntyre, who's with us, if she can maybe take us through the first appendix, which is the cycle youth justice, and then if there's any questions going from there. You happy, Zach? Yes, sure. Thanks, Gail. Maybe if you want to take us to the, the monitoring report. I will. 
do so. Good morning, I'm Gail McIntyre, Service Manager in Children's Services, the Social Work Division. Um, in terms of SACRO, uh, SACRO is a long established national organisation working independently and collaboratively across Scottish communities uh, to reduce youth and adult offending and to address the issues underlying the offending behaviour. Within Falkirk, the organisational aims for SACRO are to provide an early and effective intervention service and this is um, delivered through an early and effective intervention group where referrals are received, discussed and allocated to a service. Um, another aim is to divert young people away from offending behaviour and escalating offending. Um, an aim is to improve community safety, mm -hmm. to focus on restorative work, to support statutory social work intervention, to provide services to high risk young people, including assessment and intervention programmes, and to reduce the risk of young people being accommodated by the local authority. In terms of the specifics of what the service deliver, they provide services to young people between the ages of eight and 17 across all communities in Falkirk. The criteria is that the young person would have been charged by the police or be involved in antisocial behaviour or negative behaviours within communities. The service work with at least 70 young people per year and they accept referrals through the Early and Effective Intervention Group or direct referrals through social work, education, health, police, children's hearing. All young people involved with the service are subject to an assessment and an uh, intervention programme that's tailored to the specific referral um, that, that has been received for them. This will be based on the nature and severity of the offending. As well as the assessment, uh, young people, their progress and wellbeing will be measured at the start of intervention, and that will be then tracked again during and after the intervention to see if there has been a positive impact on the service and improved outcomes for the young people. In terms of performance of the service, the service have met their targets within the financial year, working with 71 young people. 54 of the young people were males and 17 were females. Uh, almost 67% were under 15 uh, uh, years of age. 54 action plans were successfully completed with a wide range of intervention programmes, including anger management, health and wellbeing, consequential thinking and education and training. There were six high risk referrals for young people involved in sexual or violent offending and assessments and intervention have taken place with them. The Outcome Star uh, Assessment Tool, which is used to measure uh, young people's progress and well-being has evidenced that 80% of young people reported they found the service very helpful and the further 20% said it was somewhat helpful. 100% reported that the service had been beneficial to them. In terms of the cost of the service, as Brian noted at the start, it's just over 78,000 with very little increase um, since in the last three years. I would want to note an inaccuracy and apologise on page 21. I have actually said the budget has remained unchanged, but there has been a slight increase from the 2019 budget of 5,000 over the three years. So in conclusion, uh, and before any questions, I would say that in terms of the need for the service, they are meeting all the targets. They are continuing to get a flow of referrals. What we pay for in terms of the service is the staff costs only. We don't pay any accommodation or equipment, so it's only staff. They are evidencing that they're having an impact and improving outcomes for young people. And any reduction in cost would have a direct impact because it would be a reduction in staffing and therefore a reduction in the service that they would be able to offer. They are having an impact because they're reducing referrals direct to social work and one of the key aims of our Closer to Home strategy is to reduce the number of young people that are accommodated. And what we do know is that young people involved in escalating and high risk offending are likely to be at risk of residential care and the most extreme would be secure. These are our most high cost placements 
uh, and the highest spend for the council. So that would be my summary of the report, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Gail. Um, anybody want to start? Okay, Councillor Balfour. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a, two or three questions. Um, page 18. A, it says that there's an additional 20 places. Um, can you explain how that's financed? And a, is there any additional or any scope for additional places? Yeah, so what we've done is increased our targets and increased our expectations. So Sacro, we're working with 50 and we've asked them to work with 70. So there's no any cost implications for us. But what we've asked Sacro to do is work in a more focused way so that we're really clear that um, we've got a plan of intervention. The plan's delivered over a period of time and then they move on if things have been successful to then free up capacity for new referrals to come on board. So that's what we're trying to do to create capacity and ensure a regular flow of referrals. So in terms of would they have increased capacity, to be honest, I think they're probably working to the maximum that they can, given that we have increased it by uh, 20 young people already. Right, OK. Um, right, just another couple of questions. Um, page 19, uh, near the bottom it says 10 young people did not want to participate. What happens in that case? If young people don't want to engage in the service because it is early intervention and some, it, it would depend on the nature of the referral. So if it's early intervention and it's assessed to be really low level, it may be closed. It would always come back to the EEI, the Early and Effective Intervention Group, for the group to collectively discuss what should happen next. So they may take the decision that it is low level and that we could close it and if a new referral comes in, we would pick it up again. They may take the decision that because of the nature of the offence that they wouldn't be satisfied to leave it. And in that case, they could make a referral to social work or a referral to the children's reporter. OK, um, just one final question, uh, page 20. Um, <clears throat> they say that six young people have been re-referred due to re-offending. Um, what happens in that case? Is there a different approach to how they're dealt with? Again, it would depend on the nature of offending. But if yes, if they're re-referred, it then it may be that they have a more intensive involvement, so more sessions per week, maybe longer sessions or the focus of the sessions might change. So they might have been looking at uh, well-being, um, but then the, there's been an offence involving violence, so they may then want to do a specific programme around uh, violence and violence reduction. If the offending continues again, we do have an option that we do have a youth justice social worker within the social work service and also depending on the severity of the offences, they may be referred to the children's reporter. But that's what we would want to avoid because that then brings it into the statutory forum. Yeah, OK. All right, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Councillor Binney. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gail. I, I totally appreciate Sacro does make a difference to the young people. Uh, I do have a question, though. Um, it's obviously very positive to see many different options of these support programmes. Uh, I would like to know which are the most attended. And I'd also like to know, do you get feedback from the young people, what they actually want? Do you consult with them and do they have more popular support programmes uh, programs than others? And in, in amongst that, does any of the support groups uh, overlap the support provided by other organisations funded by the council? Okay, thank you. So, so in terms of... Oh, sorry, there's quite a bit of feedback there. The, the, the programmes would be delivered on a one-to-one -one basis rather than group work, although SACRO are able to offer group work. So on page 19 and 20, it does list quite a wide range of different areas of programmes that have taken place. So these are with individual young people. And as you can see at the top, the highest uh, or the most common programmes that have been delivered during that financial year have been around anger management, victim awareness, resilience and confidence, consequential thinking, 
and then CBT offending behaviour. So these are the most frequent. In terms of young people having a say, absolutely. At the start of any intervention, uh, time would be taken with a young person to talk about their well-being, their progress. We don't just focus on the offending, but it would be about speaking to the young person and identifying what they see are the areas that they would like to work on. So they're involved in helping to design and agree what type of intervention would take place. Uh, in terms of overlapping with any services, I think there can always be some level of overlap because we have family support services and as you can see from the list of things they do, they would work on um, better choices, health and well-being, education. I think the difference with SACRA is that they have the skills, the training and the experience to work uh, around the offence specific work and also they're trained and really experienced in restorative work. So while certain areas of the programmes could be covered by other services, I'd say that SACRO are quite um, distinct and skilled in the areas that they deliver uh, in relation to youth justice. And the only other youth justice service that we have is one singleton social work post within the council. Thank you, Gail. So you're, what you're saying is you're more specialised in this area. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Binney. Councillor Redmond. Uh, uh, hi, how are you? Um, just one question you were saying most of your cough is down, uh, costs are down to staffing. How many staff is it uh, that you actually employ? Uh, there is um, 2.5 project workers within SACRO. 2.5? Sorry. 2.5. Right. Right. Part time. All right. right. And then, see, just like, another question. See if a, I don't know, a young child came for you for a, an anger management course. Like, how long would that last? Would they be, would they just get two or three sessions or do you work with them throughout a period? Like, could you work with them for years or what is, is, is that? So it wouldn't be years and it would be based on an individual level. So it would depend on the nature. So if they'd, if somebody had been involved in fighting in the community, but haven't been charged and they're quite young, they're only, you know, um, 12 or something, then the, the programme might just be a couple of sessions. But if they've been involved in a, a number of offences and it's more serious, then the programme is So it's no prescriptive in that each young person will get a set amount of sessions. All right. That, that's good. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Thanks, Jack. Um, can I ask you, in page 18, uh, as uh, Councillor Binney said, they were asking about um, if other teams, mental health teams, are involved, like CAMS and that, with SACRO. Are they? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so CAMS may be involved with the young people. We, it is an early intervention service, so maybe the young people don't need that. They might be accessing school counselling, but CAMS could be involved uh, with any of these young people as they might be with young people involved with social work or other services as well. Thanks, Gail. Um, a third, in page 21, it says a third roughly of the people, the children involved were somewhat satisfied. Um, do we follow up the reasons that they weren't fully satisfied with the, the problem, uh, with the, the work that's been done with them? Um, so I've not got that level of detail available, but um, I think within that section as well, it does say that 80% were very satisfied and 100% said that they benefited from the service. But I don't have the wider detail in terms of beyond the scales. OK, thanks for that. Um, another point that I bring up, uh, page 21, that um, in the conclusions it says that SACRO ensures timely support. Can I suggest that maybe earlier mental health treatment for some of these children uh, would save them from actually getting involved at all with SACRO? Cut addiction problems and that, because I hear a lot of them are talking about anxiety, that it's helping to calm their anxiety and perhaps if they were involved with mental health teams before it gets near where they're actually offending, we might get, um, it might be more beneficial to us as well as them to have that sorted then. 
do you quite understand what I'm getting? Yeah, I, I, I agree mental health has a contributing factor and it would be helpful for young people to access more supports. I think as a council and as a children's services partnership, there's been a lot of work done to look at early intervention and mental health services. So there are a, a range of services you may have heard of the CUT service and there's different services where young people can access um, face to face support or online support. So there has been a lot of uh, work done in that area. But that would be separate from SACRO. They're a youth justice service and we're, we're looking at developing other mental health services. OK, thank you, Gail. Anyone else? No. We want the next item. <clears throat> thank, thanks, convener. Thanks, Gail. I think that's the end of the questions for you. Um, so I think we then turn to the second appendix, which is committed to ending abuse, and that's uh, Joanna Stewart, who's going to take us to her report, convener. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so most of you will know that committed um, to ending abuse have delivered services um, in the Falkirk area for a number of years now. They offer a, a three-tier support model that deals with initial crisis of a domestic abuse and then on to the ongoing recovery from the trauma of abuse. Members will know that domestic abuse and gender-based violence is one of the six key themes of the draft Falkirk, um, sorry, the, the Falkirk plan now, which is highlighted as a, a major public health, um, equality and human rights issue. Uh, the Gender-Based Violence Partnership um, are responsible for driving the overall improvement and the delivery on this theme, and um, they monitor and they um, the prog and report on the progress annually to the community and yourselves. Uh, they are also responsible um, for taking forward the review of the domestic abuse service um, delivery, and the partnership have been working. Um, over um, the last year to review this and ensure that we have a clear and effective pathway of support for victims of domestic abuse. Um, this has made significant um, progress over the last six months and we hope to have a path forward in the coming months in regards to the review. Um, but we are also taking some learning from the Scottish Government's own independent review and their funding stream for violence against women and girls, which has been just undertaken. And I think that will give us some really valuable evidence to assist us to um, know the way forward um, with that, with, with our own um, review as well. Um, uh, committed to ending abuse is um, inspected under the care inspector. Apologies, my dog's barking. <laughs> Sorry, members. Um, the service is inspected under the care inspectorate and receives po positive feedback from inspectors inspections on the delivery of its services. Um, hasn't been inspected since December 29, understandably, um, with the pandemic ongoing. Um, but when they were um, inspected in 2019, they have see received very positive um, reviews with scores of five, which is very good for support and care and quality of staffing. Um, and they are confident that the staff are informed to deliver effective support to the people within its service. Um, last year, when I reported to committee, I mentioned the impact that the pandemic had had on the organisation and also on service users and those approaching the service. It still would be fair to say that there's still an ongoing recovery um, from this with victims coming to the service after a period of, period of time when they felt very much um, trapped in abusive relationships. So as a consequence, the organisation, and it has really been for, for some time now, has seen a year on year increase in case loads. Um, and although the rise in numbers this year has, has not been as significant as previous years, we're still seeing an impact in that um, ongoing rise. And it has put significant strains on the organisation um, in terms of its workforce and its finances. Uh, I have noted in my report concerns around the organisation's financial situation. Um, we've been working very closely with the organisation and also the Health and Social Care Partnership over the last year um, to review um, their finances and look at their um, ongoing funding sources. Um, and as an interim measure, we have, uh, and in light of the impact of increased referrals that they have experienced over 
um, you know, the last four or five years um, awarded some short term um, additional funding to allow them to maintain their service delivery and also to avoid staff redundancies and um, avoid creating waiting lists um, for their service users. Um, so, and as, as I've mentioned, um, the review is ongoing and that review um, of the domestic abuse services um, for the full council will also look at the budget and um, what is aligned to that and the needs for that for future service delivery. Um, finally, the organisation absolutely continue to work with those who are deeply affected by domestic abuse in this uh, Falkirk area um, and in also very difficult circumstances. Um, as we enter another period of uncertainty with the cost of living crisis, um, the, the organisation will have another um, challenge ahead to support their service users um, through the anxieties of, of that period. However, I'm, we're confident that they're supporting their assistance um, as always and, and as it did through the um, pandemic as well, will go above and beyond to ensure that um, victims of domestic abuse um, that support them are, are, are supported. Um, so just any questions if members have now? Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanna. That was a very good presentation. I do know how important it is this organisation is committed to ending abuse. However, I've got a question. Um, a note actually you said in the report 5.8% uh, in referrals for 2021. Also, the waiting time for appointment has risen from one to four days. With that in mind, you know, thinking about the service users, thinking about the women, thinking about the men, thinking about the families. What impact has had that on vulnerable clients? And is there a greater risk to these clients because of this? And what, as an organisation, what is actually causing the, the delay exactly? And I'll just add in to that the question, the extra funding that you've been given has that made a difference to the target presently? Thank um, you. Um, sorry, feedback there. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, yes, well, I, I suppose you've kind of answered your own question there in terms of the additional funding was to tackle that waiting time and, and address that waiting time. The organisation um, came to us with um, significant concerns that um, people were waiting. It is a risk. Um, every um, individual that comes through the service, they go through initial um, safety risk assessment. Um, and that's so important to ensure that their safety is, is um, measured and that they're given the advice and the protection that they need to ensure that they're safe in their homes um, or in their accommodation. Um, so that was that was one of the fundamental reasons for us to provide the additional funding so that they had the staffing um, capabilities to be able to see people as soon as possible and that waiting time could be reduced. Thank you. Is the waiting time now back to one day? Is that the um, time now? I'd have to just double check because I don't have the figures right in front of me, but it, it has improved. Um, I, I do remember our last discussion with the organisation that the additional funding ha had allowed them um, to maintain their service delivery and improve their, their service delivery. Would it be possible to get that information yeah. and find out what these targets are? I think that yeah. would be very important. Thank Certainly you. Certainly I can get the first two quarters performance information to members. Okay. Thanks. Um, anyone else? Oh, sorry. Deputy Provost. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, it's just on this 5.8% uh, increase as well. Um, is there any indication why there was an increase? And do they think that there may be additional, additional increase going forward? Thank you, Councillor Balfour. I think I get this question every year in regards to why there's an increase in, in the number of referrals coming through. And it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, sometimes it's just about victims' confidence to come forward. Um, I definitely think during the pandemic, a lot of people didn't come forward because they were very trapped 
um, and so there has been a, an almost a kind of build up between that period. Um, but also people just being a bit more aware, um, media campaigns, um, encouraging people to come forward. Um, and, you know, there, there, there is the, the kind of evidence shown in, in domestic abuse studies that it does take some victims up to seven to nine times um, of, of instances happening for them actually to approach the service. And, and we know in Falkirk, it's in our Falkirk pan, that you know, domestic abuse is a, a significant issue within the area and, and often rising. So it, it's a consequence of maybe just our, our community. But it is just as well, I think, just about people's confidence to report and to come forward and, and accept advice and assistance. And, and that's just become more evident over the years. Tolerance okay. levels, I suppose. OK. Um, OK, the, the next thing was the, the funding. Um, <clears throat> They've got some additional funding from the council, but have they got any sort of plans or inroads to getting any other additional external funding? Because yeah, it, it's obviously yeah. they're going to need more money because it's, uh, it does seem to be increasing at the moment. So, yeah, yes, Councillor Balfour, I have had um, significant discussions with the organisations about them being able to access um, additional funding. Um, over the last two years. To be honest, it's, it's a yearly discussion that we have with the organisation. I think the difficulty the organisation has had that during the pandemic, a lot of funding sources had um, ceased taking applications and there was a lot of small pots of money, but not the big pots of money that, that were in existence. So um, we have been working with the organisation and encouraging them um, to um, look at, at other funding sources, and they have been they have been successful in prior years. And I just think the knock on impact of the pandemic has has impacted on that. It's a very competitive market as well, um, in terms of what what organisations are handing out to. So and very specific and very in depth. So I have asked the organisation to look into how they can improve. Um, their um, alternative sources of um, finances. OK, um, I mean, it, it is a essential service, so it'd be good if they can get the money they need to continue the good work. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Edmund. Oh, thanks. Um, just looking at uh, some of the key, key aims and objectives, it says formerly known as Falkirk District Women's Aid, deliver services to women and men who are experiencing or have experienced domestic abuse. Do you have a, a breakdown of the percentages of, is it maybe 90% women, 10% men? Uh, would, would you know that? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have it right in front of me, but um, I, I do know that there's not, there's, there are more, what I would say is that probably over the last five to six years, we have seen um, men approach the service and there has been an, a, a obviously an increase from zero to you know maybe 10 um, it's not a huge amount but it actually is that the, there are there are men that do approach the service and are looking for assistance and also those who are in same-sex relationships uh, i just think maybe if, in, in other reports going forward it'd be interesting just to have that and yeah. just to see just to, oh, the thing uh, one one more question is um the funding you get, what are your main expenses? Is it, is it staffing? Is it premises or things like that? Is yeah, uh, the staffing, um, obviously to have a, an office that, that the public can walk into is important for the organisation. So they do have a an office up in Wellside Place um, that the public can walk into. But yes, the main staffing costs are surrounding staffing um, to have specialist independent domestic abuse advisors and um, that are um, trained um, in risk assessments and able to give the valuable support um, to uh, service users. Perfect, thank, thank you. Convener, possibly now that uh, all the members by yourself have asked questions, it may be appropriate to ask the Public Protection Portfolio Holder, Councillor Devine, if she wishes to make a comment. Hi, thank you, Ryan, through you, Convener. Um, I just wanted to ask what sort of advertising um, that you do um, to promote the work that you do here. 
Um, so um, at the moment, committing to ending abuse have, have recently um, revamped their website. So they're doing they're going to be doing a launch in regards to that. Um, it's been difficult over the pandemic, obviously, to publicise the organisation, but um, in previous years they have been putting up posters in public places and and often you might have seen in some public toilets, some little um, tear off slips that you could take um, from, from public toilets. But a lot of a lot of the organisation's work is actually done through word of mouth of the communities knowing about um, what's happening um, and also working with our partners and ensuring that they know about the organisation and they're able to um, see signs and able to um, uh, provide people with um, information of how to access the service. The majority of people accessing the service are, are, are doing that on their own, their self-referrals. Um, they're coming off their own accord. Uh, just further to that, do you know when the website launch will actually be? No, 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 not off the top of my head. If you could let us know, that would be great so that we're able to then share that through our social media as well. Um, because I think I think there is a great power here the, that we can reach a lot more people. And I understand that it's self-referrals and, you know, I understand the ratio of when people have been abused to they actually start reporting it and come to access services. But sometime, sometimes having that ability to just raise awareness around the issue um, to the kind of general public, um, there might be someone that we actually catch through social media um, that maybe don't know about you or don't know how to go about contacting you or, you know, it might even just spur them on to have the courage to actually access the service uh, to begin, you know, a safe life for themselves and their children. Thank you. Thanks for that. Anyone else with anything? Thanks, Joanna, for that report and for getting back to us on the things that we weren't too sure about. And when this website comes up, it'll be fantastic. Thanks again for being there. Con convener, just before Joanna and um, Gail go, um, just to check the de your decision, because there's options in the report. I think from what you're saying, your understanding is that the committee are happy to approve and acknowledge the progress made by the, the two external organisations, and you're not looking for any sort of formal reporting back. But in your um, discussions with um, to do Sacro, I think that you had asked a question of Gail about, um, let me just check my notes, on the, the feedback where some people had been somewhat, the children had been somewhat satisfied and you'd asked whether perhaps you could give a, a note to the committee afterwards on just what's done to analyse why people are uh, somewhat satisfied, what that means and then what follow-up follow actions there were. And then I, I think there was three points of action for Joanna on on her item, which were um, whether the waiting times had improved. I think Joanna said she would get back with the first two quarters performance. And then there was a question on um, from Councillor Redmond on the breakdown of male to female referrals, which I think Joanna said that she possibly looked to include in future reports. But if there was a current breakdown, I think that would be helpful for committee. And then the final one was about the website. And uh, Councillor Devine asked whether um, a a date could be given of the launch of the website, so perhaps we could get those pieces of information to the committee when it's fantastic. Yeah, if that's okay for Joanna and Gail. Is it okay for you, girl, ladies? Yes, no problem. Yep, that's fine. So that's come back. Yeah. Thanks very much. Then. That's Thanks. Possibly, uh, convener. Um, <clears throat> now that we've finished that item, the next one, is, as members will see from the agenda, it's uh, a performance report by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. If we can maybe just have a two-minute adjournment, so that I can uh, bring our colleagues from Certainly. the Fire and Rescue Service in. Okay, if that's okay. Fine. Thank you. Thanks, convener, for that uh, allowing that short adjournment. I just want to double check that Councillor Ritchie and Balfour are back with us as well. Brilliant, thank you. So the next item in the report, convener, is the performance report from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. 
just by way of background, um, the formation of Police Scotland and the Scottish, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, there's a, a requirement for both organisations to, to report performance to local authorities. In Falkirk, the committees have previously asked for an annual report um, to come forward sometime after the end of the, the, the financial year. So this is the first chance we've had to, to meet, or give it a chance to meet the Scottish and Fire, Fire and Rescue Service this year. The annual report's presented on pages 28 to 53, um, and we're, we're joined by, first of all, I'll introduce you to uh, the new local commander, Kenny Barber, who'll take us through the report and can maybe answer any questions. Thanks very much. Thanks, and, um, good morning, all. Um, yeah, Kenny Barber. I've now been in the post for a whole four days, so <laughs> go easy. <laughs> um, just I'm really delighted to to be here and, and and help support and continue the good work that that's been going on within um, the the Falkirk community over the the years. So I've uh, got a good team. Um, for me, there's a, a, a huge emphasis in, in elements got to be put in place in collaboration, and I think that there's, we, we can go th we'll go through the report and. I'll bring my colleague in in a second, but I think the huge part is is that we can't do it alone, and, and regardless of what organisation or service it is. So, um, I'm delighted at the relationships that are already formed, and we just just look to help keep supporting them. But I'd like to just introduce the um, Group Commander Stevie Mickey. Um, Stevie's head of prevention protection for for the area, um, and Stevie will now take you through the. The, the report and then we'll be happy to address any questions following that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kenny. Uh, Stevie. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, and as Kenny says, um, I'm Stevie Meekie, the Commander for Prevention and Protection for the Falkirk area. Um, <clears throat> as my first committee here, I've been in post six months um, in the area, so 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 um, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to speak to you, so thank you for inviting us along today. Um, I don't intend to go through the report in detail. The report has been available for members, um, so I intend to go through the performance summary um, on, on, on the page with the performance summary, just to go through the key performance indicators to highlight some kind of key information and then hand back to Kenneth and then we'll, we'll, we'll look at questions and comments um, from members. If I could firstly look at the performance summary, um, I intend to go through the indicators briefly. Um, if we look at the first performance indicator for um, all accidental dwelling fires, we can see there that the indicator is red. That's indicating that we've had a, a, a higher than 10% on, on the previous year or the target has not been achieved that was set out within the plan. What I would say around the, the figure for accidental dwelling fires is that you can see in the, the, the detail within the report um, that it, it, it evidence is the fact that we're having an increase in accidental dwelling fires, but the severity of those accidental dwelling fires are continuing to re reduce. So, you know, the majority of accidental dwelling fires we attend is either no damage or, 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 or damage um, limited to the item ignited first, which is predominantly cooking incidents. And whilst that could appear negative, there's a there's a positive within there. So the the, the attribution to to that could be and, and, and is evidenced by the amount of alarms that, that, that we're fitting, the, the messages that we're getting out there in communities, both for our operational crews and our community action teams and indeed our community planner partners that we'll work with. Um, to kind of spread that kind of home safety message and the home fire safety visits that we continue to to do um, for communities across Falkirk, alongside the, the the upgrading of alarm systems from the the limited alarms that we got from Scottish government to provide to to to, to homes who are identified as high risk and are owner occupied. That. Um, reduction in severity can also be further evidenced by the second performance indicator, which is accidental dwelling fire casualties. However, I think it's important before I go into the detail that I do acknowledge that sadly we did have a fire fatality and that was in April 21. Um, and that was within the Falkirk North Ward um, and some, some, some information around that. Um, you know, it was a single occupancy dwelling um, and it was smoking related um, and um, the community alarm activated us to that. That, that, that incident and unfortunately the occupant did, um, did, did did pass away so I would just like to acknowledge that and continued work with partners to prevent those kinds of incidents happens on a daily basis an hourly basis and um, to ensure we get the correct referrals to ensure we do the right partnership working to identify any vulnerable individuals but going further into the detail for accidental dwelling fires it is the lowest figure 
um, that, that we've had over the last five years for, for dwelling fire casualties, um, and it's almost 50% reduction than last year's figure. So that further evidence is the fact that whilst we've got an increase in accidental dwelling fires, we certainly absolutely have a decrease in the severity of those fires. We're getting called out more to more routine smaller incidents, which in, in our view is positive because we're going to make sure everybody's safe. We can put mitigation measures in place when we get to those incidents and work with our planning partners um, to, to ensure that if those um, communities need any further support from us or indeed any other community safety partners, we can put those things in place. The third indicator I would like to discuss, and, and, and um, it's quite clear to see that there's a significant increase in deliberate fire setting. So 518 for the period 21-22, um, which is the highest over the last five years and significantly higher than last year. There's some context around that within the appendix, within the report, which I'm sure you've, you've managed to read. Um, but I think the main point to highlight around that is the last in a two years during COVID has been very, very difficult. It's been very, very difficult to engage with who we see as our key audience when we want to get that safety message there out with our partners um, in police and community safety around positive behaviours and educating and informing predominantly young people um, in, in, in the schools and, and other educational establishments around positive behaviours and responsible citizenship. So. You'll see some context in the report that we have now um, started to re review our plans post-COVID. We've now got all our operational fire stations and our community action teams now adopting both primary and secondary schools, and they're now responsible for those schools for the planning year um, to make sure that we can catch up and start to build those positive relationships. We've taken a step further by ensuring that our, our watches and, and, and community fire stations now have a responsibility to contact primary schools, adopt those primary schools, and determine what work we can do with the education partners throughout that planning year. And that's starting as young as nursery doing uh, the people who help us. And now we've, we've established that we do want to get back in and see them in P2 and again in P6 and P7. So that's a programme we've started. It's voluntary for the schools. It's mandatory for our stations to contact the schools and try to build those relationships. And we hope to see the fruits of that labour in the months and years to come when we start to develop those positive relationships with the young people. If we go on to non-domestic fires, which is the next indicator, um, we'll see that there's a, a number of 70, another, another red indicator. What I would say is the, the non-domestic fires and the fire alarm UFAS indicators, which are at the bottom, are, are linked this year. If you look at 2019-20 and 2021 during COVID, we did have a, a, an unusual set of circumstances in relation to the statistics. So people were behaving differently in their houses, which again adds to the accidental dwelling fires because everybody was in their house and they were doing more things in the house. There was more cooking, there was more um, socialising within the domestic dwelling than people going outdoors. So there was slightly more risk there. But non-domestic fires, which are fires within business premises um, and unwanted fire alarm signals, again within business premises, during 1920 and 2021, businesses were starting to close down. People were working from home. In 21-22, we started to open back up again. Um, and systems, alarm systems and, and, and businesses hadn't been operating um, as they had been post-COVID. And it resulted in unwanted fire alarm signals increasing due to maintenance, due to lack of management um, procedures, and also increased slightly on non-domestic fires. But if you take the stats for 2017-18 and 2018-19, which is a more relevant indicator for that COVID period, for those two indicators, you'll see that it's just um, around the pre-COVID average um, for, for those years. And if we look at then, the unwanted fire alarm signals, we can see that that's actually take last year out of the equation due to the, the, the shutdown in business premises. Um, it gives us a lower figure and it's the second lowest over the five year period. The other two um, statistics, again, um, the RTC casualties um, and the non-RTC casualties, so RTC being road traffic collisions, um, we can see for the, the RTC casualties, again, 2021, very, very low due to the road network not being as busy, the traffic absolutely being a lot less on our urban and rural roads, and which resulted in that low figure. So it's given us a red indicator for 21-22, but it's still lower than the three-year average before the kind of COVID period. Um, and again, the, the, the non-RTC casualties is sitting around the same and it's below the, the kind of four year average. So I think just given that kind of context around the, the key performance indicators, I'm aware you've had the report. I would quite 
happily now hand back to, to Kenny and um, just to kind of wash up the report and, and, and invite any questions. Thanks, Stephen. And just very, very quickly, um, Katie, I'd just like to obviously touch on Stephen's mentioned there that we are comparing these with, with two years of, of, of a point in time in, in society that probably none of us have ever experienced. And I, I think when you look at and compare it to the preceding years, um, I touched on before, prevention's key and engagement's key to that and, and, and the work that's been done in the, the local communities where we're getting that downward downward trend with a real dip obviously during during COVID. So it might look like a higher spike, but I'm really comfortable and confident that um the really strong relationships that we've got between partners um and now that we've recommenced and re-energized that face-to-face -face engagement within our local communities that we can really start to see that downward trend starting again. We've obviously done early analysis that's not in here as to where we are currently through through the current year um, and we're already starting to see that there is a there is a, a difference so um i think that the stats that we're presenting um are fully related to to, to the negative impact of, of not ha being able to have that face-to-face -face, um, engagement during that time and re-energizing that so I just wanted to, to, to highlight the bits and, and happy to take any questions, Chair. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, guys, for your really full report that you gave us here. Um, very interesting. Can I just ask, you were speaking about working with the schools. Um, do you get a lot of antisocial behaviour against yourselves when you arrive at fires and that still? Uh, th thank you for the question, and, and I'm actually pleased to say that within the Falkirk area, um, during that reporting period, there was no reports of attacks on fire crews. Um, so that, that this period also takes in last year's um, you know bonfire period, where it's more historically busy and it's more historical to have that kind of behaviour. So I'm very pleased to say that, that, that despite us not engaging face to face with young people in the schools at that time, there was no physical violence. Verbal violence very very minimal but did occur and um, but was very very quickly dealt with um and um, support from our police colleagues to deal with any of that that, that, that behavior is always is always there and um, first and foremost um but you know it's it's a positive picture and i hope it continues for this bonfire season as well fantastic yeah i'm happy with that um the folk area is encouraging the fire service rather than, than being against it especially kids no Yes. Lorna, uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, I want to commend you for your performance report. It's excellent. I wish all reports were like that. It's very easy to read and I love all the data in it. So it's easy for me to understand. Just wanted to say that first. However, I do have several questions. Um, a note on a... There was a, I know there was 129 accidental dwelling fires. The reasons, one of the reasons was given was 33% having no smoke alarms. Um, in relation to all the dwellings in the Falkirk Council, is that cause for a concern? Uh, also, within that question, um, it's now the law, as we're all away, to have a smoke and heat alarm in Scotland from February 22. Now, you, can you break down uh, those 33%? Was that council housing or owner occupier? Is there a breakdown for that? Thank you. That's my first question. <laughs> Stevie, you want to answer that? Yes, I. Yeah. I, again, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, the 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 question around is there a breakdown that that can be provided. Um, however, wh what I would say is that for for um, registered social landlords, for local authorities, and for private um, rented, um, that has been law for some time to have that alarm provision. So. Um, I think um, you know a housing committee um, would would probably be able to answer that question in relation to how they are within the local authority, within the the private setting. It is mostly within the the, the private dwellings that we come across them, and um, without giving you that formal analysis, because that law has been in place for some time for private rented and registered social landlords. Um, the the 33 percent to answer the second part of the question, the 33 percent um, is. It's kind of always around about the thirty percent, and that's why, you know, as Kenneth says, that the partnership work and the working with our, our social work colleagues, our, our occupational therapy colleagues, our, our, our colleagues with across the community plan and partnership to to identify to us when we have 
you know, members of the community who don't have alarms, we need to get them in there before these types of activities happen. Um, what I will say is, if we do come across um, fires, and bear in mind that the majority of these fires were kind of very, very minimal um, in, in severity, um, we'd never ever leave that property without fit fitting the alarm. Um, if they don't meet the high risk owner occupier standard for getting the, 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 the interlinked provision, we'll always fit standalone and give them the advice and, and, and information they need to then secure that alarm provision that they need. So um, I, I would be quite, quite, quite content to say that, um, you know, housing, um, should 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 be give you the, the the information around their alarm systems and and, and we're looking after the kind of owner occupiers um, to, to encourage that. Um, Good, uh, Kenny, you want to come in on that? I, I was just want just want to quickly to build on that, and I think that's why the the collaboration is is key because it needs to be targeted. We need to work with partners to get these individuals, the, the most vulnerable in society, identified to us to allow us to get them that that support. And just the final wee bit, just to build on that. After every one of these incidents, we'll also have done what we call a post-incident domestic response, and um, where we will engage with all neighbouring properties in that and, and offer them a home fire safety visit and identify whether they've also got a lack of detection within their, their private dwelling, etc., and, and give them that support because it's, it's quite often identified that while there's a fire within a house, the neighbouring properties it sometimes gives them a, a bit of anxiety and a bit of fear. And it's, it's an ideal opportunity to offer that reassurance and make sure that they also have a, a, an appropriate smoke detection within their, their house and also a fire action plan that should an incident occur within their own premise, they know how to, to do it as well as any preventative measures that they might wish, wish to take. So there is a bit of work that's done around that. Thanks, Kenny. Councillor Binney. Yeah, I've got some more questions, yeah, yeah. a couple more. Uh, yeah, I'm really pleased to hear that. And um, what, uh, you know, because that's what I was thinking that 33%, you just don't go away and you don't do anything. You either give them advice, give their neighbours advice, or you're the high priority ones. You actually fit the smoke alarm, is that correct? So I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> on, on the back of that, um, I'd like to know if you have adequate funding for all that to do that. And is it the numbers that you have actually put in these fire alarms? Is it possible we could have the numbers for the Falkirk Council area? You know, it's it's all to do with funding. I appreciate that, but, but it give us an idea that you know the work that you've done for this uh, smoke alarms, which is important. So uh, I would I would like that if that was possible. Uh, th thanks again for the question. I can provide that. It's not contained within this report. What I would say is, um, on the on the appendix, um, it does um, state how many visits we've done. So just just to give you assurance that we target our visits on 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 anybody that wants one, but we really need to focus, as Kenneth says, on the high risk vulnerable individuals that we need to support, and we need other partners to help us with that. So if you look at that context, we fitted. Um, so, sorry, we, we undertook one thousand and seventy. Um, home fire safety visits during the reporting period for last year and that's broken down into 584 within the high risk category now that's a very very high percentage and that kind of evidences the fact that our referrals we're getting from our partners yes we want to increase them we want to increase the numbers and we want to see everybody we possibly can but that statistic alone evidences that we're actually reaching the right people because 584 out of 1070 visits in a high risk category is, is, is extremely high um, so we are getting the right referrals and we're meeting the right people. I can uh, get back to you um, after the, the meeting, obviously, with a separate report just to let you know how many we've fitted. Um, in relation to to, 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 to funding, um, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, nationally did receive a limited budget from Scottish Government, um, and that was purely to look at um, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service being able to support high-risk owner-occupiers within their private dwellings, simply because the legislation has been there previously to deal with um, the, the other ones I mentioned before. Um, what I will say in relation to that is, at, at this current time, we have adequate alarms to continue that programme within the Falkirk um, area. Um, we're quite fortunate in the fact that um, when, when I came here, we done a bit of analysis around how many visits had we been doing, how many do we anticipate doing um, to reach these um, vulnerable uh, individuals that we want to support, and that secured us um, some more alarms um, and for the area um, on, on the back of that work. Going forward, um, there's um, it's unknown at this moment in time what that budget's going to be or if that budget's going to be supplied. So at the moment, we're working with the budgets we've got, the, bu the money we've been given, and making sure that anything we use from that limited stock we do have 
is targeted to those high risk vulnerable individuals. I'm quite happy to provide a report to let you know how many we've fitted. Th thank you very much on that. Uh, I do have another question, yeah, is sure. it okay? Um, but I, actually, it's, um, I, I noticed at Falkirk's Heath, that's actually my ward, it's got the highest uh, number of deliberate fires. And I have an idea what the reasons are for this, but I wonder if you could maybe tell me why that ward in particular is, is quite significantly high. Um, I believe, actually, uh, deliberate fires, um, it's like 98 and compare, compared maybe to the, the, the lower breeze and things like that, you know, it's you know a great increase. But I, I, I have an idea of the reasons, but I don't know if you could maybe just you know, give me more information on that, what, why you think that is. Yeah, Ken. Uh, sure, and, and again, thank you for the question. Uh, if, was that Falkirk South you were mentioning there? Yes, yeah. So we see the ones in red, so the, the Bones, Black Nest, Grangemouth, Falkirk North and Falkirk South, that, that was our kind of four kind of highest pinch points for, for, for that reporting period. Now, if I go back to to, to, to my initial kind of opening um, remarks re relating to deliberate fire setting, where there are pockets of, um, it's, it's antisocial behaviour, it's, it's, it's deliberate fire setting predominantly, um, predominantly by, by youths. Um, it's predominantly grassland, heathland, as you can see in, in, in the context, occasional rubbish and the occasional wheelie bin. Now, the figures are significantly higher this year. Um, there have been that figure before in, in, in Falkirk South. Um, there's other areas that have crept up um, also, as I've identified. There's been an increase across um, a number of wards. There's been an increase across nationally for deliberate fire setting, um, if I'm being honest. And I think I still maintain that there's a couple of things here. One is that face-to-face, -face, direct, positive engagement with young people in their schools, in their community groups, at their youth clubs, and that's the kind of interventions that we're, we're now pushing and getting back to doing to build those positive relationships. So I think there's a bit of an issue in relation to the relationship breakdown during COVID. Um, we're doing a lot of work um, with our police colleagues, um, who you'll be speaking to later, I, I understand, and, and then we'll be referencing some of the partnership working, but we're doing a lot of work with our police colleagues and our community safety partners to look at interventions, so, so, so positive interventions that, that show us all in a positive light and allow us to have that kind of positive relationship with the young people. So I, I, think, I think COVID has, has not helped by us not having that face-to-face -face positive information. And I think um, now we're able to target where we've got these anti-social behaviour issues. We're in a stronger place partnership-wise in relation to working with our police and our community planning partnership and our community safety partners to put meaningful interventions together to support the young people and 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 try and discourage the, the kind of hanging about in the streets and, and, and setting fire to stuff because um, that's the, for me, that's, that's the way we're going to do that, build those positive relationships with our partners to engage positively with, with the young people. Um, that's my kind of thoughts on that one. Thanks, Davy. Um, Deputy Provost. Thanks, Convener. Um, I think uh, Lorna has asked most of the questions I was going to ask there. Um, I had some concerns about Grangemouth, obviously, because almost every section uh, Grangemouth has got a red mark. So, um, but I think that's kind of been answered. Um, just a couple of other things then. Uh, domestic uh, fires, accidental domestic fires in the home sort of thing. Um, as somebody who had a fire uh, relatively recently uh, <clears throat> in the kitchen, um, you mentioned that you give out uh, smoke alarms. So what uh, happened with myself was I had a, a small fire extinguisher, which managed to put the fire out right away. Had that not been the case, then things would have escalated very, very quickly. Is there any sort of scope for giving out small fire extinguishers as well to people or encourage them to get one? Because they're, they're relatively inexpensive and having first-hand knowledge, um, I think they're very well worth having. Yes, yeah, Stevie. Thank you. Th th thank you for your for your question. There, there's kind of two elements to this uh, um, question. And I think the first response is that 
um, well done for you having a fire extinguisher in your house and, and, and having the the, the 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 knowledge and the uh, and the understanding to to use that safely. I think what we do in relation to providing that advice should a fire occur in a house is firstly make sure we've got the alarm provision and make sure we've got that routine that that, that Kenny talked about um, earlier around the nighttime routine, the daytime routine, and you know not having your washing machine on during the day and and a visit. We kind of aim for that fire not to start in the first year, but we see all too often where the message we give is if the fire uh, starts, close the door, switch off um, the power if it's safe to do so and get yourself out and call us out. And, and that's what we maintain to do because we've seen all too often, um, unfortunately, people who have tried to tackle the incident, whilst it starts small within it, within a very short period of time, it can escalate. So our advice would not be to tackle it with an extinguisher in a dwelling unless you've done that kind of training, unless you've got that experience and you're happy to do that. Our advice is to get out, stay out and call us out. And, and that will continue to be to be our advice. But I, I do um, you know, understand your question. So we'd rather try and discourage it from happening in the first place. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, yeah, that's fine. Um, just another quick question. Uh, the RTCs, um, what, what kind of training do you carry out regarding a motorcycle accidents? And just a, a kind of side link to that, um, the, is it worth handing in old crash helmets uh, for you guys to use for training? Steve. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll answer the second part of your question. First of all, yes, that would be absolutely more than welcome. We do have, um, as part of our trauma training that, that our crews receive um, across all our on-call and hold time stations, part of that is dealing with a motorcyclist who has, unfortunately, you know, came off the vehicle, came off, came off their, their cycle and requires medical supervision. And part of that is safe helmet removal. Um, so that would be absolutely welcome to, um, to have those helmets um, provided to us. The, the more we have, um, um, the better. We do have a stock, um, so I would welcome that because they're probably better than some of the bashed ones that we have at the moment. Um, so, so thank you for that offer. Um, so tra training-wise, we, we, we do a, an extensive annual program for road traffic collision training, and it involves all vehicles. It involves heavy goods vehicles, it involves um, light vehicles, it involves cars, um, and it also involves motorcycles. So we have a variety of scenarios that our crews will attend. On station, they will do the trauma, they will do the helmet removal. We've also got um, a, a, an initiative called Biker Down. Now, Biker Down is an initiative where we've got members of the, the motorcycling community and members of our teams who, who run a course on um, cycle safety um, and um, first aid um, provision, which includes the helmet removal you've just discussed. We've not run that um, due to COVID for obvious reasons, but we've now got plans in place and we've got um, some local um, members within our team who are trained and have done the biker down processes before. So they're planned to continue into, in, into next year and we're going to get them up and running. Um, so, so thank you for the question. Again, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, that does. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I've got a helmet I'll, I'll hand in at some point soon. Um, the biker down thing, it'd be good to get a bit more information on that when it's kind of up and running. That's of interest. Yes, absolutely. Once we've got that up and running, I'll let the administrator know to, to, to circulate that and members will be welcome to attend um, and, and get more information and, and, and come and view should they wish. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. Uh, Councillor Redmond. Oh, thanks. Uh, just kind of following on a wee bit from what Lorna was saying about um, deliberate fire setting being high in some areas. Is there any, like, not even just in wards, but particular buildings or somewhere that becomes a flashpoint for repeated fire raising? Is there procedures in place for, is it users or do the police take the matters on? Um, do we, could the owner make it more secure? Is there, can you maybe explain that a wee bit? Is that... Yes, I, I absolutely thank you for the question. So the majority of the double fire setting is, is, is just, there is no trend. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite sporadic and it's quite opportunist. Um, mm -hmm. However, there has been some areas where it's been, you know, derelict buildings or buildings due for demolition, where we've had repeated antisocial behaviour and significant issues. But I'm very pleased to say that that with our um, colleagues and police and our colleagues and um, the local authority, 
um, we can very, very quickly put um, partnership um, working to the fore and, and share that information, share that intelligence, and remind, um, you know, working with our, um, um, particularly our planning officers, um, you know, with dangerous buildings, um, making sure that the occupier knows it's their responsibility to have that secured, to have that fixed, um, and, and, and we do that routinely. Um, we're just in a, a period just now where we're actually doing environmental audits of areas with our operational crews on the lead up to the bonfire time um, for this year. And part of that audit process is to review our derelict disused buildings, make sure they're secure, passing the details to our partners and work to make sure we get them secured and, and, and they're safe, not just for fire, but other antisocial behaviour or any injuries for anybody getting into them. So we, we work as hard as we can to, to identify uh, and make sure they're secure. Well, I think that puts people's mind at ease. Um, just one final question. Uh, obviously, a lot of areas like in, our, in the public sector are facing a lot of cuts just now. Um, with regards to the fire service, are, are you looking at any? Have you got enough money? Is we've got enough fire stations? Are any fire stations looking at getting closed or uh, appliances? Or have you, is the number of firefighters? How's that went over the years? Is that increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it staying the same? Is um, that, that would be just a bit of information on that. Um, again, th thank you for the question. I'm pleased to say that locally, um, you know, we've got a ridership factor which, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it 96%? So, so we always sit, um, you know, 96% or above, and um, we have done for a number of years, and that is our target operating model. So, so locally, um, that's our target model. We we'll, we'll continue to meet that, and our current um, fleet and personnel numbers, there is no um, threat to to change that. Um, there is no on the immediate horizon. There is there is no issues. The fire cover will maintain the same. The number of staff we've got will maintain the same, and our appliances will maintain the same. Yeah. Perfect. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Any more questions? No. Well, thanks, guys. That was an excellent presentation and informative. And if you get back to us in the one or two points that were brought up, thanks again. Uh, I think we'll be having a short break now and we'll be back on in five minutes. Thanks. OK, thanks, convener. I think that's us ready to reconvene if you're happy. If we could just check councillors Balfour and Ritchie are back from the short adjournment. Brilliant, thanks. Hi, guys. And we're now on to the, the final report and agenda, item seven, which is the Police Scotland Falkirk area performance. And as I said in my introduction to the last report, Police Scotland provide a, a annual report and performance to the scrutiny committee. As with Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, this reports for the year 21-22. And we have with us uh, Chief Superintendent Alan Gibson, who's going to introduce the report. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Brian. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, colleagues, uh, both in the room and online. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Alan Gibson, Chief Superintendent, Divisional Commander for Forth Valley. So I'm delighted to be with you all in person this morning after a number of years of doing this type of event online, it's really nice to get back uh, around the, the physical room with colleagues, but also to join colleagues online as well, which I know hybrid working, obviously, like our organisation, is very much the way forward. So so great to be here. Um, I'm going to say a few words, if that's OK, Chair, and then hand over to my colleague on my left, Liam. Sure. Um, Liam, Liam took over as the local area commander for Falkirk in May of this year. I took over from Chief Inspector Craig Walker, who some of you may know. Uh, Craig Walker retired. He was of an age and, and of a vintage to retire, so he took that uh, that decision earlier this year. I'm delighted that Liam has joined us as the local area commander for Falkirk. Uh, he lives and breathes Falkirk and has done for some 25 years, I think it is, joined as a cadet, so I'm delighted that he's joined us. I'm going to hand over to him in a, in a minute or two, but uh, what I would say is he brings significant experience across Falkirk through those years of, of experience across the Falkirk communities. But I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to, to discuss the report this morning uh, regarding the policing activity across the various Falkirk communities. What I'd probably say is whilst the report is detailed and, it, and, it will, and, and Liam will bring out a number of key activities within that, um, it doesn't probably, it is a snapshot and it doesn't really fully give you the, the sheer volume of, of, of different matters that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis across Falkirk. Uh, and specifically, um, we have dealt with and continue to deal with a significant amount of vulnerability, particularly in the space of mental health uh, and other uh, issues of, of, of folk across this area who are in crisis. And our officers spend a long amount of time working 
uh, both uh, in the policing setting, but also with partners to try and obviously resolve that issue for individuals across our communities of Falkirk. So, um, I probably pause just to, to congratulate members on their on their appointment. It's it's really good to work with both old faces and new ones. So many congratulations. With that brings, I'm conscious that not everybody has a policing sort of background and, and maybe has limited knowledge of how the police service operates, both both within Falkirk and across Scotland. So there's probably an offer that I'm going to make right from the start. If anything. Uh, that I say or Liam says is perhaps um, we'll try and avoid pseudonyms and, 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 and acronyms and all that kind of good stuff. But if there's anything that we say that's just confusing, please stop us and, and correct us. But equally, out with the setting of this meeting, if there's anything you want further explanation on, please reach out mm -hmm. to us. We're more than happy to meet with any member individually to talk through our specific action activity into any particular topic which affects the communities of Falkirk and, and beyond. Um, as I say, um, as a snapshot of the work that I'm going to now hand over to Liam, uh, who's going to talk us through a couple of key elements before we give as much time as possible to obviously answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chair. Hello, everybody online in the room, Chair. Um, thanks for the invite today to come along. So it's just my intention, just to give you a little bit of background about in each of the, the sort of subheadings within the report. I'll just give you a bit of context around some of uh, the statistical data and then just keen to hear any questions or any points um, from yourselves. Um, so the first one, just in regards to the response uh, to the concerns of communities, the one I'll pick out from there is just around the off-road motorbikes. Um, so in terms of um, the antisocial behaviour of the off-road motorbikes and around the Victoria Park area, um, so we had some installations of signs, some um, multi-agency site visits as well that we conducted there. We also done a bit of um, intervention work in the schools with our schools-based officers, um, just regarding the dangers of off-road motorbikes. Then moving on to the next section of enhancing our collective resilience to emerging threats. Um, just the one I'll pick out there is um, in terms of our county lines and the cuckoo and the practice of individuals effectively taking over the homes of vulnerable individuals to take drugs. This is something we obviously take very serious, not just across Police Scotland, but in Falkirk as well. Um, and it's something that we work um, not just when uh, partnerships uh, externally, but internally using our, um, our intelligence officers, our CID officers, our response and our community teams and also our prevent officers as well. Then moving on to protecting people most at risk from harm. So just touching the headline there is the asylum seekers, this down at um, a Cladden Hotel in Falkirk, currently used by Home Office and Mears Housing. Um, it's been getting used there since October 2021. 20, uh, and um, our community inspector Andy Tuff and community sergeant Stevie Lorimer have fortnightly meetings there um, just to ensure um, everything's going okay. Promoting confidence through our actions. I would just like to highlight Operation Christmas. So this is something that um, occurs every year when we focus our efforts on high visibility patrols in and around Falkirk Town Centre for our business community and also the, the residents and any visitors we have. A good bit of uh, partnership work in there as well with Transform Forth Valley and the businesses in and around Falkirk. Um, and the last one, so the road safety and, and road crime. So just mention a wee bit about the Falkirk crews and um, what we do um, in terms of that. So it's the first Thursday of every month and it's not just the police officers um, from Falkirk that get involved in this for the preventative aspect because we totally understand that um, it's not just within Falkirk. There's people come from out with. Um, so we use our roads policing department. We've used uh, um, our drones before as well um, from the, the air support unit um, all to try and make that a sort of safe, uh, safe environment to work in. Uh, sorry to attend. Um, and just in terms of the statistical data on the, the back pages that you'll all have read, I'll just start on page 26. So you'll see there that the comparative analysis is from uh, two financial years. But what I've done for this one is I've actually just, when I saw the statistics and the percent of changes, I wanted to get a bit more context around that. So what I've got is, and I can share this as well um, after, is the five year um, averages across this, just to give you a bit more context. And a couple that I'll, I'll pull out there on page 26, so our common assault. So on the, the, the difference, the 272 more victims and the 20% increase. So we know that it's 1,630 um, for the last year that we're reporting on. The actual five-year average is 1,640.4. Then the other one I want to pick out is the number of domestic abuse incidents report to the police, which you'll see um, the increase there as well. The five-year average is 2,088. Now that's still an increase. Um, and also the number of crimes and offences domestic abuse incidents have increased as well. 
Now, the reason why I want to talk about this increase is, um, from a policing point of view, actively encouraging the report of domestic abuse. Um, we at Police Scotland have a zero tolerance to approach to domestic abuse. Um, we can uncover more uh, controlling behaviours, coercive behaviours, um, which actually links into the statistic at number 16, which is a 5.6% increase in the, the detection rate for domestic abuse incidents. Um, then on to page 28, the vandalism and malicious mischief. We'll see a percentage change of 2.7, which is a slight increase, 31 more. The five-year average is actually 1,306 um, reported crimes for that period. Now, the last one I just want to talk about is number 29. So it's in relation to the road traffic casualty statistics. Now, the April 2021 to March 2022 statistics show six. That's actually a divisional number there. To give you a bit of context for the last five years, so 2018, there were three road deaths, 2019, three, 2020, two, 2021, two, and year to date is zero. So that is all I want to sort of give yourselves in terms of it, and I would uh, welcome uh, any questions or points. Here's the Hey, thank you very much. Uh, Chief Inspector Harmon for presenting. That was that was great. And uh, I love to see all the data. And also your narrative was very good as well. Let's me see what's happening across the whole Falkirk Council area. I just have two small questions as as the Mark Hart. And one I think probably impacts on everybody and it's what you, what I would say is like a a silent thief as a matter of fact is all the fraud and scams that's out there in society. Um, you know, I'm, I'm personally myself, I'm noticing more and more, like I'm getting texts all the time, every second day, emails as well, uh, and phone calls actually in the scam. And because there's obviously an increase in digital, we're in a digital world now, it's easy, the scammers to hide behind that. However, what my question is, is uh, regarding yourself and I totally appreciate you're raising awareness and things like that. And I have seen some social media out there uh, regarding that. But what we're actually doing to try and catch these scammers, because, um, and what I would like to find out possibly as well within our Falkirk Council area, how many people have actually been impacted? You know, is, is somebody phoning up every day and saying, you know, I was scammed, you know, I lost some money, etc. There must be numbers, data out there that has impacted people in, in the Falkirk Council area. I don't know if you have that information or not. That's my first question. OK, thank you very much. In terms of number of persons impacted, I don't have that data here, but what I would say is it's not just about direct impact on the victim, it's about indirect impact as well. So that victim's friends, family, relative, um, dependent on the, the age, dependent if they're at school, if they're socialising. So you could actually argue there are a lot more people impacted than just the victims themselves. So thanks for recognising the campaigns that we do. And whilst I'll admit that predominantly focus, focuses on social media, what we're trying to do just now is work out ways and how we can get that out further rather than just social media because we do recognize whilst we have tens of thousands of followers on our social media accounts not everybody has social media not everybody follows us on social media so we and i would welcome feedback in terms of this and how we can get um the sort of preventative measure out there in terms of um the the offenders um when these crimes are reported and they occurred they are investigated what we do tend to find is a lot of these um, come from abroad. You know, they, so they come from um, abroad out with uh, the sort of UK jurisdiction. But um, so in answer to your question, the impact, I could give you a number of um, victims, but again, how many people are impacted? It, it's much it's much wider than that. Um, but that goes for a preventative measures as well, because if that one person reads something on social media, then they can share it with their friends, families, and do the retweets and these kind of things as well. I hope that answers your question. I appreciate that the, the scammers themselves might live out with the UK, so it'd be hard to actually uh, to take some action against them because of the distance, etc. Uh, I do have one little more question, if that be all right, Kalina, to ask. I noticed the data um, on sexual crimes was quite high. It was a significant uh, increase from the year before. 
Uh, am I right in reading that? As, um, obviously, that's quite sensitive, but can you give me a broad um, piece of information, maybe saying why that is? Is, is there a reason for that, you know, that it's significantly increased? Is it been because of the lockdowns? Is it because they're more digital, that sort of thing? So, similar to the, the, the new domestic abuse legislation that we use, it's similar to that in terms of encouraging victims to come forward. Um, and that's what it's about. It's about encouraging victims, giving them the confidence. Um, because a lot of these crimes, um, you know, they'll go for years and people just don't have that confidence to, to report it, to disclose it. Um, so we're actively encouraging that. Um, I added in the, the five year one for uh, number of sexual crimes as well. So the five year average is 401.8. Um, obviously, we're still at 453, um, so that's an extra um, in terms of you know, number of victims. It's, it's still a large amount um, over the course of the year. Um, a personal note, I would put that down to the encouragement um, and to give victims the confidence to, to report it. Thank you. That's reassuring. Chair, I don't know if I could maybe come in on those points. Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Councillor, if I just come in on a couple of different points, if that's OK, just to further explain in terms of what Liam's mentioned. So you mentioned fraud. It's a really good point, actually. So on page 10, Operation Hatpin is described there. It's a horrible set of circumstances, obviously focused on some of really vulnerable individuals, but it probably illustrates very well, as you described yourself, is that, that, that fraud, fraud is old crimes committed in new ways. That, that's effectively what it is, and it's, it's exploiting the internet. And as you say, one of the challenges we face as an organisation, which is the same as most public safety organisations, is it's, it's transnational, it's not even trans-UK. So we quite often have perpetrators who are operating from all points in the globe. So that makes it particularly difficult to pinpoint and bring the offender to, to justice within Scotland. That said, we have had six, some successes, as Op Hatpin describes here on page 10, whereby it was pan-UK, which gave, gives us a, a bit of a start for 10 because it allows us to work within UK policing territory. Um, significant success there in, in bringing those to justice or certainly reporting those to the to the fiscal and the Crown Prosecution Service down south, but also the, the, the removal of, of ill-gotten gains, shall we say, from those responsible. So interestingly, that one has cryptocurrency involved, so that shows you the modern nature of crime these days. It's not actually physical money, actually some of it's turned into cryptocurrency, which again puts a whole different um, kind of sphere onto this type of crime. What I would say is we've had to change our operating model within the organisation to deal with that. So what we do now have to do is spend, have officers dedicated to online investigations, which is not something we've seen 20, 30, 40 years ago, which is very much about visible policing. Actually, we, you know, through our, our crime campus at Gart Cosh and other areas of Scotland, we operate uh, crime investigators online who go and look at not just fraud related crime, but to your second point, sexual related crime, because we're also seeing sexual related crime even committed online now. Um, and as I say, that, that itself has increased the amount of reporting that we've had in terms of sexual related crime. And my last point, I suppose, being that the, the, the lockdown period, as we all anticipated, there would be more harms indoors. And, and that has been seen to be come to fruition. So we have, albeit not included in this data set for the support period, we have seen that start to lessen because obviously we've come out of a lockdown period with all that. Not the harms have not gone, but a number of the harms have been reduced by the fact that folk are allowed to come out and also have greater access access to services, which weren't always there, to be frank, during lockdown. So I don't know if that helps, but that's some context, Councillor. Thanks very much. Deputy Provost, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions. Uh, the off-road bikes, um, still see issues with that. Uh, at different places, um, but it, it mentions that you've been putting in fences and bollards to help reduce that. Um, whenever I've asked for that, they always seem to tell me that they can't do that because it, it stops um, prams and wheelchairs, etc., getting in. So, is there some kind of specific fences or bollards that are in use that allow um, access for people who should be getting in um, and prevent access to motorbikes? I can't answer that in terms of what the specific type of fencing is, but from a bit of uh, local knowledge from uh, friends staying over in the um, in the Stirling area, there are certain styles of um, open and close um, metal structures. Um, but I'm sorry, I, ca I can't answer that in terms of what structures we've, we've put in place. I can certainly try and find that out for you, Deputy Provost, and get back to yeah, you. Yeah, that would be that helpful. Would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, next when the uh, Operation Christmas, um, it mentions that you, you focus on the uh, Falkirk Town Centre. Um, uh, what what happens in other areas? Is is there any provision to expand out to other areas as well? Thanks for the question. And yes, there is. Um, not only in Laporte Precinct and in Grangemouth, but also in Stennis Muir. Um, we've got a, a large number of shops, large number of premises there. We all know the big um, shop premises that uh, attract um, persons to come and go shopping as well. So whilst this focuses on Falkirk Operation Christmas, it is around Stennis Muir. We've also got some uh, shops, obviously, in uh, Church Walk in Denny. But Stennis Muir, from our community policing point of view, will go to the sort of bigger towns as well. So our Grangemouth, Laport Precinct, Stennis Muir, and around the Plough Hotel area, and out to Denny as well. Okay. All right, that's all just now, thank you. Thanks, Dave Provost. Um, Councillor? Uh, thanks. Oh, cheers for the report. Um, just a few questions I've got. So the first one was, is there any data on uh, drugs and alcohol? What, what percentage of crimes are they involved in? And maybe mental health as well? Like, uh, just obviously, it's really good the way to set out. We can see, see all the different crimes, but it'd be good to see know what, what problems around drugs and alcohol, mental health, you know, if we knew it, how that. Okay, thanks very much. So um, there's no data in this report. What I can do is we have analytical teams who could provide some context around that in terms of um, whether somebody was either under the influence of alcohol or drugs. But um, it's quite a difficult one to, to put context around, to be honest with you. Um, but I can certainly ask the question to try and see um, if we could get any data around that. Just thinking off the top of my head, that would rely on the, the officers dealing with the individual involved to input that data in, so the, to get a clear reflection on that picture. Uh, uh, I was just like, if you arrested somebody, I'd assume you'd write a report and it would say if they're, if they're suffering from, uh, if they're under an influence of drugs or alcohol, I mean, how that, that would happen, wouldn't it? So in terms of any vulnerabilities, if there was vulnerabilities I identified, then we would put in vulnerability uh, forms or IVPDs, oh, right. which in, and also in the body of the report it mentions are, are EIRDs for what a public protection unit are doing. Um, but yes, these things will be they, they will be documented in our police systems, um, and again that relies on the, the input of the of the officers dealing. Right, right. Uh, that's it. And then just uh, my next question was, uh, oh. Uh, the very last page was there was complaints about officers. Um, I was just wondering, can I show you the number of complaints and things? But I was just wondering, what did these result in? Did was any officers suspended? Was all the officers cleared? Were um, you know was it was there any cases of officers corruption or something? I don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it doesn't tell you the full story there. So it's certainly something we could look at to see if we can get kind of disposals of what happened and the outcome. Mm -hmm. It can take quite a while. Um, so it would probably, it would be difficult to report on, but not impossible. The reason mm -hmm. I say that is, um, so for example, if, a, if an officer gets accused of a criminal matter, which does happen from time to time, um, it would go to the fiscal service to their specific, um, for their specific, specific assessment. It would then go through the fiscal service to whatever disposal the fiscal decides is appropriate, whether that's action or no action. It would then come back to us potentially for misconduct. So it can literally take years to get to to get yeah, to the for, for the high end allegations against officers. The day to day stuff where it's maybe something more um more um more lower level, maybe it's um, incivility or, or somebody feels that they've not been, that their, their complaint has not been dealt with properly. That That's easy enough to report in because that gets resolved very quickly. But I suppose just to temper expectations that the, the high end stuff, we have no control of time case. scales because it gets taken away from the police service to report on. But it's not impossible. We can certainly have a look at it and see what's in the art of the possible. Oh, that's brilliant. And then my last question was uh, page 28. Uh, we had the detection rate for housebreaking uh, and shoplifting has went down a wee bit. Well, it went down quite 10% for shoplifting. And then, well, my last isn't very good, a few percent, 6%. Actually, it's, it's actually in the column next to us. That's how, how good the report is. 6% uh, it's went down. So, is, is there reasons for that? Is there maybe things we could look at to improve in on that? 
So in terms of, um, I would call it sort of a cause of crime where, where sort of theft by housebreakings or theft by shopliftings. So yeah, we can see that the detection rate um, has dropped. Um, in turn, um, the number of theft by shopliftings is dropping as well. So, um, and I've actually put in the five-year average there for a while as well, sorry, which you won't see. So last year in the report, you had 573, which has came down from the year previous. The actual five-year average is 734. All right. So whilst theft by shoplifting is dropping, um, yeah, I can see that the detection rate is, is dropping there as well. So um, in, in terms of how, how we how we measure that, um, we have uh, our, either our community officers or our response officers, which will take ownership for shoplifting. But, um, and then theft by housebreakings, we have our um, divisional acquisitive crime team, our priority crime team, who take ownership and responsibility for the housebreakings. Uh, with anything, um, criminals adapt their ways to, to get away with something. You know, we have great CCTV provisions um, in and around Falkirk, um, not just in the shops, but obviously from a, a public space as well. Um, but from a shoplifting point of view, if, a, if an offender or suspect wants to go in with their hood up, with their mask on, um, we will struggle for that identification. Um, but just from a reassurance point of view, when we do get reports of shoplifting, we do get reports of housebreakings, they are investigated as best we can. Uh, that's interesting. If I could come in, Chair, if that's okay. So, um, yeah, it's really good, really good observations. I suppose I'd probably home in on theft by housebreaking. One of the things, just for context, that lockdown brought us was a massive drop in housebreakings. Why? Because everybody was clearly at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and whilst none of us want to go back to that period in history, I'm sure um, it, it, did sh it did show that, that the opportuni opportunistic nature of housebreaking, as, as Liam describes here, one of the challenges we face is housebreaking invariably needs forensics either need somebody to call at the time when the action is ongoing, but, but criminals are in general terms in, involved in housebreaking are, are relatively well organised and will know that if they, if they act in a certain way and, and, and their call is not made to us, the chances are we will have to pursue them after the crime is committed. So therefore we're heavily dependent on forensic analysis and we will send forensic officers um, through our forensic services to do fingerprint lifts and DNA lifts, etc. But again, one of the challenges we get is if, if a criminal is, is, is astute enough to know how to um, how to, to disguise their movements, shall we say, then it, it makes it quite difficult. It's not impossible, but it's a difficult crime if we're not quickly informed of it, whereby we're effectively having to rely upon forensic analysis or indeed the stolen property being identified in the possession of somebody, which obviously does happen. So um, there are a number of different things we need to do to increase that detection rate, but I don't think any of us mm -hmm. Would, would want that to be lower than it, than it currently is. We want it to increase because obviously it's such an invasive crime to break into somebody's home. It does include garden sheds, but I think I think we would all all accept that that's not quite nearly as, as impactful uh, as breaking into somebody's home and, and you know all the, the heartbreak that that brings. But it's a really good point. Thank you yeah. for raising it. I suppose the thing is as well, it's the percentage of crimes. It's not actually the percentage of perpetrators. Like somebody could go out and shoplift 10 shops and get caught for one. So you've only got them for one crime, so maybe the detection rate's only 10%, but you've got the shoplifter that's carried out more crimes, so it could, that could screw the yeah, a wee bit as well. I mean, shoplifting, as a mixed economy, you do get you do get people who commit one or two shopliftings, but you do get organised groups who travel the country, mm -hmm. and that's how they exploit, loop, not loopholes, but how they exploit opportunities as they'll, they'll appear in one town or city. Uh, one day and then travel many miles across Scotland or indeed the UK and target somewhere else the following day. And again, that's where our, our centralised teams within our crime command come into play. When things are cross-border or indeed cross-national, they can take these types of inquiries and run with them because obviously it's very difficult for a community cop in Falkirk to try and resolve something that's happened the next day in Aberdeen and we wouldn't expect them to. Their focus needs to be Falkirk. So um, that's one of the benefits of us being able to work nationally as they can take that kind of uh, focused, organised criminality and deal with it that way. Yeah. But that's brilliant, thanks. So I can I just add one more wee bit to your point there? So when um, the Chief Superintendent was talking about our sort of cross-border criminals, so um, we utilise uh, Retailers Against Crime Scotland, RACS, um, for sharing images of persons and identifying um, not just localised um, shoplifters, but if somebody has been committing an offence in Linlithgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, so there's some joint up working there um, across the board as well. Yeah, that's good. Cheers, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Councillor Devine. Hi, and thanks very much for coming along today and presenting the report. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points, if that's okay. Um, 
so in your report, you've put in here about third party reporting. I just wonder if you can uh, explain a bit more about what third party uh, third party reporting is and why it's important. That would be great. That's my first one. Sorry, what section in, t in terms of the third party reporting? Sorry, have you got a page number? 76. I'm looking at it on my computer, so that might be right. slightly different for you. Page 16. So, so a bit for me about third party reporting is as well, it, it's for um, maybe victims that don't have the courage to report things and other people can report um, on their behalf as well. So we are, um, we, are, we as a police service are aware of it. Um, and so we can um, investigate um, things better. Um, so that's a wee bit of my understanding context around uh, third party reporting. Yeah, it's just, I've done a lot of work on this um, several years ago, I am, um, and I can really, you know, see the benefits of having third party reporting. I am um, especially like localised, you know. So, for instance, you can have them in colleges and universities, like you know, in community hubs, etc. So it's good to see that we we now have that provision in Falkirk. Um, just to touch on another point, um, just to follow on for Councillor Binney's point around scamming. Um, you highlighted that you are aware of, obviously, that not everyone has social media, yep. not everyone is uh, up to the digital age or wants to be up to the digital age. Um, so my concern is, what do you do with vulnerable elderly, for instance, you know, who maybe live in kind of more isolated communities, um, but also who live in kind of like um, shelter town, what used to be called shelter towns, and it's now, um, you know, retirement housing. Like, how do you engage with that community, given the fact that Scotland has an ageing population? Um, so if you could just expand a wee bit on the work that you do on that, that'd be great. Apologies. One of the one of the, the uh, things that we piloted a number of years ago was led by DI Jim Thompson when we used our prescriptions. So we put useful information out on the back of prescriptions. Um, so when they were getting delivered, there was some um, handy information there. What else other considerations we're talking about is the, the health environment. So our, our hospitals and our, and our doctor surgeries as well. Um, so these are a few of the considerations that we're, we're going to be trying to roll out. Um, our community council meetings. Um, maybe getting, uh, you know, we've got a local newspaper, the Falkirk Herald, which is still read by, you know, numerous people. So getting something from a policing point of view into the Falkirk Herald as well. And again, getting people talking. Um, any other ideas um, to get out there to the, the wider range of members of the public? I'd be more than happy to, to hear suggestions to, to try and improve that as well. Um, just on that, I do have uh, a good recommendation for you. A lot of the housing associations actually welcome um, police, fire, uh, any sort of kind of rescue services um, to actually come in and do kind of like we, it's like a kind of afternoon tea thing where they have discussions around um, public safety, you know, and, and different things that are kind of going on in a very relaxed environment. And it's always over a cup of tea, so you get a biscuit. Um, so, and there is a number of these uh, retirement housing uh, in Falkirk. Um, so, you know, I can touch base with you later on uh, about the best way to get involved with them, no problem. So, um, Councillor, we'd welcome that. Um, I, I suppose I put it in the context of my 90-year-old mother who told me last night that she'd went to one of those such events, not not in the Falkirk area, but learned about Berlini. I'm not entirely sure that was the public safety message she was expecting, but we would welcome the opportunity to do that. As Liam says, we're, we're actually, this, this very same subject came up at the Stirling Scrutiny Committee and your, your counterparts in Stirling made the same point. And I probably give you the same reassurance I gave them is that we don't we don't focus wholly on social media because we know it's not everyone's cup of tea for a whole variety of reasons. So we, we welcome opportunities. 
uh, and we welcome the support from you as, as key community leaders to, 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 to signpost us because we can't simply know everywhere that, that's best place to, to, to contact the most vulnerable. We know many of them, but they're always, we don't want to leave MD out, to be honest, to your point, Councillor. It's important that we spread our messages as wide as possible, but also open up that ability for them to contact us with, us with worries or concerns. I'd probably raise a second point in terms of your, your, your commentary around about third party reporting. I am concerned that we, we need to do more in that space. I'm really pleased we've got it, but I don't think it's working to its potential. And again, that's, a, I guess, an ask and a plea of, 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 of elected members to help us. Because again, it's probably it, us driving it, we can certainly support it fully, but us driving it might not be the secret of success. I think it needs to be a collaboration to get that success. So I would welcome both any elected membership uh, support or indeed any others that you could signpost Liam and I to, if that would be helpful. Thing and then, then I'll leave uh, Councillor Binney. Um, you spoke about, uh, and it's been referred to by uh, Deputy Prophet Balfa, about the uh, community Christmas, um, that you go into like Falkirk, Grangemouth, Senesmuir. Obviously, given the fact that Bonest doesn't have a police station, um, and as one of the local members that represents that ward, I um, I just have uh, concerns around what do you do in towns like that, for instance, that don't have you know a police officer around the corner. And I know the community cops do a great job; I um, they're absolutely fantastic. But again, I it suppose it's just to kind of reassure people who live, especially in my ward that, you know, have issues with the fact that we don't have a station in Bones. Like, what kind of mitigations do you put in place for that? Thanks. So from my point of view, our community police officers for each area and the ward areas are embedded within our community and they should be there. So um, the community officers for Bones, yes, they will they will start and finish their shift at Grangemouth, but the expectation for me is their, their shift is, is in Bones. Um, so please, uh, apologies if I just mentioned Laporte Precinct, Stennis, Muir and Denny. Each of the ward areas for their um, uh, their officers will be out and about, and not just for Operation Christmas, and not just during the, the week as well. In terms of antisocial behaviour, weekend policing plans um, through the week, not night shifts, but through the week um, and our weekends, our, our community uh, policing members will be in their ward areas. Um, so Bones will still get that attention. They have their their, uh, their dedicated community officers and sergeant um, up there. Answers the question. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, uh, would you okay if I just quickly quickly see yeah. that uh, going back on the third party reporting and things like that, and talking to the many many people in my community, what comes across to me quite a lot is people don't want to tell the police their name basically they want to do it anonymously because they feel that they could be targeted by somebody in that block or somebody that knows them and things like that i know we've got a website however there's people out there but what i think would be good would be a feel safe way to keep that person's anonymity because that way i think the police would get more reports in and can we raise awareness of that as if there's already a vehicle or a way in the community, a way in your website that can do that? Is that something that's already there that somebody can do that? I am, I'm not sure. But what I would say about anonymity is if um, if we do get reports of anon from an anonymous member of the public, or we will still act on that. You know, if somebody reports something anonymous, anonymous to us, we will still act on it. We won't do nothing. We will either um, attend the incident or we will um, look into it um, via a number of sort of policing skills and tactics that we've got. Um, it's somebody's perfect right to remain anonymous if they do, and we can still progress inquiries with um, anonymous reports. But if we do have a, a person's name, then we can we can almost evidence something a little bit better. If that answers your question at all. Yeah, absolutely. It's just that I think people are frightened, you know, especially if, if it's a crime that's happening and they want to report it, they're, they're maybe frightened. So it was to take that fear away from them and just give them reassurance that, you know, they, they can't be chased by any method at all, basically. Fear of crime is a big thing for me as well, because we want to try and reduce that as best as we can. Um, but anonymous reports will, will, still be, will still be acted upon. Thank you.
you know, Chair, can I oh, just David. come back in on that point, if possible? Councillor Balfour. Thanks, Thanks, Chair. Chair. Um, yeah, the, I've got a couple of other questions, but <clears throat> I'd always been under the impression that if people contacted Crime Stoppers, that was anonymous. Um, so, um, and I know, I know myself, uh, if somebody contacts me, I'm quite happy to pass on information anonymously on their behalf. Um, okay, just another couple of questions then. Um, we, we still seem to be having quite a bit of bother with youth antisocial behaviour, um, especially in uh, my own ward. Um, I just wondered what else can be done. They, they just seem to get moved around and take their antisocial behaviour with them. Um, so I just wonder what else can be done to try and engage to minimise that. Um, we used to have, a, in the high school, we used to have the football on at nights, and that was very successful. I, I don't know if that's running at the moment or if there's any plans to bring that back in or what else can be done. Thanks, Councillor. If I come in, first of all, on the point of the Crime Stoppers, that was the point I was going to come in on. Crime Stoppers is, a, is, a, is an independent charity. It has, it has no connection to policing whatsoever. So, so 0800 treble 5 treble 1, it's been emblazoned in my mind for many years. Members of the public are, are welcome to use that number and they will report to us. What I would probably suggest, though, it's not a reporting line for things that are urgent ongoing right now. Um, I would I would urge members of the public to use treble nine for things that are ongoing and, and it's and a really urgent matter. It's more for slower time reporting and um, where they want to talk about antisocial behaviour, drug dealing and the like. Um, the other point that the councillor makes, which is a really good one, which is I, I get and Liam gets and, and a, a range of our management team get uh, reporting from elected members, which anonymises it right away, which is a really nice way of doing it. And that gives that community member that confidence that the elected member is not going to release that information. Um, I cannot give a guarantee that if you phone treble nine, that your number will not be logged. Um, you can ask for anonymity, but to be frank, if it was a serious crime, for example, murder, and we have had murders in this area, then I can't guarantee that the police might not have to make contact with you, given the grave nature of the crime. It would be it would be wrong for me to suggest otherwise. but. Um, I'll pass now to Liam to answer the question about antisocial behaviour. Thanks for your question. So I'll, I'll break it down. So what, what are we doing? So what we're doing at the sort of locally in the police is um, not only our community policing team who, are, who, are, who I'll talk about regularly, but um, who are so impactful in terms of, the behavior, of what they do. Um, but what the um, community policing team are, are targeting just down at Grangemouth is um, our additional patrols in and around our park. Again, I, I touched on it earlier about the, the great CCTV provision we've got in around Falkirk as well. Um, we use our schools based officers to do some inputs at schools and be visible, um, not just walking about, not just on the schools at lunch times, but also that the periods when, uh, you know, for me, from my experience locally in Falkirk is uh, after school on a Friday, when the kids will go home, grab a quick piece and then be out. And whilst the vast majority of kids will have great fun, there is that small select few who will choose to cause that antisocial behaviour. And what we touched on earlier about uh, victims for the fraud, um, there's direct and indirect uh, impact from antisocial behaviour. You touched on the, the twilight football. I'll agree we don't have that in Grangemouth, but we do have it in uh, Langley's uh, just now. Um, Friday nights, our community officers are down there taking between 20 and 30 kids for a couple of hours. Um, and it's not just about playing football, it's not just about reducing antisocial behaviour, it's building up that rapport, um, that sort of just friendship uh, with the local communities as well. So for your Twilight Football point, I will take a note of that and I'll take that back to our uh, community sergeant down at Grangemouth to see if we can um, work with um, our schools based officers we've got down there, because it, it won't just be in around Grangemouth because Grangemouth can be an attraction for uh, the kids from Bones, Madison, um, the upper lower brace. Um, so I'll take that away for the for the twilight football, if that answers your questions. That's fine, thanks. Um, just one other quick question that's on antisocial behaviour again. Um, I've had quite a few uh, complaints regarding uh, drug use and odour uh, in different flats in the town. Um, what can be done to try and prevent that? In, in terms of uh, drug use and, and older, we'll talk about drug use. So uh, again, we, we touched on um, reporting to the police either anonymously or um, or given names, either via crime stoppers, via elected members, to your local community officers at any surgeries that happen. Um, so in terms of um, drugs, 
um, if we believe somebody and we have the, the power to intervene to search, we will use that power. In terms of the odours, um, if you know if somebody uh, smells an odour of cannabis in their in a, a neighbour's home address or walking by, um, it's a difficult one for the police in terms of we won't have any power to enter home addresses. Um, it can be phoned to the police. We can document it on our um, our Scottish intelligence database, and then if we do have um, sufficiency, we can follow that up with um, any form of investigation that we see fit. And but also linking in with our, our, our housing colleagues as well, and with housing officers who, who will be in and out of houses daily. Um, and it's not just about um, the intervention, but about um, drugs. It's about the education part for me as well. I mean, it's, it's um, just following for that. It's a lot of the time. It's it's maybe from a. Uh, parents who have got young children and the the smell is in the clothes or it's getting into their property as well and they're worried about the odors um getting into their children young children babies sometimes um is, is there anything that can be done if, if if that's the case yep so for me when we're talking about involving children there so it's enhancing the risk it's increasing the risk it's not just somebody smelling cannabis but it's exposing um, the youths to something like that as well. So from a local policing point of view, if there were concerns and risks around children and being exposed to drugs, then that's something that we would um, react to um, and either visit that home address or, or if applicable, document it on our vulnerable persons database, link in with our colleagues at Education Health as well. Okay. Can I just ask one more question? Commissioner Edmund. Uh, just what you were saying, were you, were you saying that there's ward officers for, or officers designated for every ward? Yes. Yes. Um, would it be okay if maybe you asked the ward officers to drop an email to all of the councillors just so we know who they are? And, and obviously a lot, a lot of us are new, so I've never met the ward officer. No, 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 listen, that's totally fine. So a couple of things for me. So you, firstly, you can go to Police Scotland's website uh -huh. for, for getting in touch with us, and then you can click on your local division. Uh, then you'll see, for example, Falkirk. Um, you'll see my face on there, and then when you come down below, it breaks it down into the ward members, and you can simply click, click on that link, and then uh, it'll link into the email addresses. All right. um, what I've done was I shared with the um, leader of the council just a couple of weeks ago, maybe 10 days ago, um, every um, ward um, officer um, and asked that it be shared. So you should have the email addresses, you should, you should have the, the officers, the sergeant and the inspector for your specific ward areas. Right. All right, that's perfect. That. Cheers. Okay, so we, it has been circulated. Uh, so I've, I've just not been needing my emails properly. <laughs> okay. no, no, no problem. Uh, thank you. Sorry, guys. Any, anyone else? No, right. Can I ask you, uh, P6 uh, responding to a drug related death? On it, you say that um, in a number of weeks, the community team uh, found who was responsible for the sales of, uh, I think it was Street Valley, I'm not talking about. What I'm wondering about is why why did we not have preventative measures to find these people before we get someone dying of the drugs that we're selling? I mean, it's, to be honest, I, I find drugs and drinks uh, scourge your society now, especially in the Falkirk, Gradesworth, Denny area. So just a wee bit about what we're doing um, locally. So we actually um, have 165 officers trained in the lock zone. Um, so naloxone is that uh, preventive point of view uh, mm. from uh, drugs administration. It's actually been, um, since its inception, uh, it's been used 18 times in the Falkirk area. Um, so we'll focus back on the prevention aspect. So when we get information and intelligence um, on drugs, we will either develop that to possible execution of a warrant. But like I touched on um, with uh, Deputy Provost there about the preventative aspect, if we're, if we're hearing information, there's risk involved. We won't wait to hear anything more about it. We'll be proactive and we will go there, sorry, reactive to it, but proactively go and visit those addresses. Um, in terms of the, the sort of drugs overdoses and near fatal overdoses, you know, it's it's horrible what's happening in terms of drugs uh, misuse and, and overdoses, not just in Falkirk, but across Scotland. Um, so we work with third party organisations, Change Grow Live, Transform Fourth Valley, 
um, at you know Falkirk Police Office, our custody office has been down the stairs has been renovated. So we have these third sector organisations working within as well. Some good information sharing. And also when we do execute misuse of drugs warrants, there's been times when we have brought uh, one of these third sector organisations across to us. So it's not just about when we do the proactive enforcement, there's the aftermath of that as well. And it's a bit about the education and we touched on it quite a bit about direct and indirect uh, impact. So the victim of the, either the drugs related death or overdose, their family, their friends, so it's about educating them as well. OK, thanks. Can I ask you another point on drugs again? Um, what's the procedure now when a person is stopped and they happen to have drugs on them, you find a small amount of drugs, saying it's for personal use, what's the actual um, procedure now with that? So in terms of that, so if we suspect somebody of being in possession of controlled drugs, they'll be detained under its legislation section 23, the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. So if it's uh, uh, a small piece of drugs, either category A, B or C, then more often than not, depending on the circumstances and background of that person, they will be dealt with at, at the roadside um, or wherever they're dealt with. Um, obviously, the bigger the, the quantity and the commodity, um, they may be taken back to the police office, they may be held in custody. Um, and then once we retain those drugs, there's a whole sort of number of procedures that, that, that we will do um, to either give them a recorded warning um, but what should happen is every person that's searched should receive a, a receipt as well, just the evidence that they, they have been searched. In terms of why we would search people, well, we have to have justification. We, we have to have reasonable cause to suspect. Or accidentally find out. <laughs> um, I, I was, so when, when you, do you actually record that you've stopped and found someone in possession of even if it's a minor quantity. Yep, so we have the stop and search register um, across the whole of Police Scotland. So when somebody is stopped and searched, that is documented and recorded in a, in a stop and search register. Mm -hmm. If they are found in possession of a, a controlled drug, um, then that will be documented in our, our crime reporting systems as well. We've also got our intelligence databases. And like I touched on earlier about the risk factor, if they are a child or if they're a vulnerable person, we will also document it in a vulnerable person database. So that can be shared with health colleagues, education, mental health, just to ensure there's, there's follow-up done around that as well. So you have a log of if someone stopped two, three times in a similar situation? Yes. You have a log of that? Yes. Excellent. That's what I was going to ask. Um, the final point, uh, well, not the final point, sorry. Again, in page 66, um, in Denny, Black Not Ward, um, and there's a lot of people in Denny affected by antisocial behaviour, um, especially in the Gala Park area. I don't know if, you, if you're aware of that. And there's been a, an increased police presence over the last few weeks uh, because of this. But we can't expect guys to be sitting there 24-7. So as soon as they move out, in comes the, the, the kids again and the same problems all start again. The point I actually wanted to make was that you have an excellent officer in Denny High School who takes boxing club. Um, he got it with a small sum, £1,000, that was all. And I don't know what difference it's made yet, but I don't doubt it's made some difference. So what I'm thinking is that perhaps if the council or other bodies would put more money into, um, as, as um, Deputy Provost said, giving kids something else to do. We have somewhere like, um, there's a five-a-side hall that's been lying empty since uh, COVID. Um, I've no idea what the intention is, uh, uh, whether it's to keep it closed or what, but using places like that and especially putting in um, perhaps um, youth leaders into these areas would help us immensely with these uh, problems. Okay, so just touched on Gallup. So I know Gallup Park well. I was uh, worked in Denny for seven, eight years. I was a community <laughs> officer there for a number of years as well. So um, I know it well. And I see the investment that's actually went into Gallup Park with the fresh shrubbery, the trees. Um, so y you're right. We do have an excellent community officer there. Um, now, it's not just about the community officer in that area as well, because when, um, when he's off duty, we will have a response colleagues who won't necessarily focus in on that, but there is passing attention given. We also, if we identify an emerging threat or risk, can circulate that, not just to local officers, but our, our nationwide assets, so our, our roads policing colleagues, our dog handlers, who are in and around our areas, you know, all, all the time, 24-7. Hmm. So if there is an area such as Gallup Park, we can 
ask for you know extra passing attention. And I totally get and understand that we cannot be there 24-7. What we can do is we can use analytical data to try and establish when the sort of peaks are, and then we can focus the resources in that mm. time. Uh, you mentioned the boxing club and uh, and the school in Denny High, which is great, which is really really good. You also mentioned about about the funding. So we we as a police service as well have access to some sort of local funding as well. And um, you know a, cu a couple of examples of that um, locally are actually the Twilight Football down at uh, Grangemouth, which, which were sorry not at Grangemouth yet. Um, the uh, Twilight Football down at Lang Lees and about match funding, and also our safe base in, in Falkirk Town Centre for a nighttime economy, but match funding, so we've just uh, matched funds for a trailer, for example. So there are options there, not a great deal amount of money, but there are options there, and we would be keen to part fund those sort of things. Um, youth leaders, um, you know, Cubs, Scouts, Boys Brigades, um, I, I don't know much about that, despite being a, a legacy Cub, Beaver and Scout in the, in the 14th, 4th Valley in Falkirk, um, but certainly, from my point of view, we provide that uh, policing resource on Friday nights uh, with our community teams down in, in Bainsford and Langley's. So that's something that um, I have to have the buy-in from the officer as well, if they're prepared to change a shift to come to come out mm -hmm. to, within the community. We can certainly look to progress that, that forward as well. Yeah, I I think getting the police involved in these sort of clubs and that is great because um, first of all, they learn about the children that are actually in the ward they're working in. And, I think we should also have people like Sacro in there where they can recognise a problem before it actually gets to the stage where they really have to be involved in it. Um, that's another area that I think we should be looking at. I was just going to say early and effective intervention, you know, so that, that that's key and um, in our sort of public protection land, GERFEC, which is getting it right for every child, you know, yeah. so that's, that's key to this as well. Right. Thanks a lot. Last point, you'll be glad to hear. Um, Page 73, or it's page 73 on our uh, agenda here, um, about refugees. How long do most refugees spend in Falkirk accommodation, such as a Claddon and that? I don't know. Um, I, I, would need, I would need to find out that, um, apologies, um, I, I would need to find out the sort of length of uh, time that refugees would, would spend in, in there. I'll find that out for right. you. Be obliged. Um, do you have any criminal activity problem around that area with, with the refugees? In terms of the, the, the sort of asylum seekers, we have, I mean, we have pockets of social behaviour everywhere. Um, so I think it would be unfair for me to comment about specific, um, just due to the small, the small group and the small number of persons there. Um, but what I would say is we do have fortnight, fortnightly meetings and any issues that are brought up to us, uh, any issues that are highlighted, they'll, they'll be dealt with the, the same as we would for any other any other issues. Well, do you know after leaving the Clarendon, what happens to them? Um, where they go after leaving the Clarendon? So I, I believe they will be um, housed. Um, I'm I'm not sure where that would be though. Right, and if they refused leave to stay, do you have any part in that? Um, no not, no, not not directly. Certainly, from a personal point of view, I've never been asked anything uh, surrounding that right. um, since my tenure in post, so, so, since sorry. the start of May. Yeah, sorry. Uh, what I'd probably add to to Liam's commentary, chair, is that um, we have a diversity officer in, in the division, Helen Old, who's worked with the, the residents of the Clad, and, and they've changed over time. So it's not the same the same folks that have been in there throughout. Some have moved to other parts of the UK, and, and for other reasons, moved on. But what Helen, on, on behalf of Liam and I, does is, is she makes sure that those that come into that, that facility um, understand the environment that they've come into. Obviously, from a public safety perspective, obviously, some of the norms from, from the part of the world they've came from might be slightly different to here. So perhaps how they, how they act and behave is important so they don't come full of, of our laws and customs. So a lot of it, we, we're not the only partner involved in that, but, but Helen, on, on my behalf and on Liam's behalf, goes in there to give them a policing public safety perspective. Again, so they, need, they don't needlessly find themselves falling on the wrong mm -hmm. side of the law and obviously therefore coming into conflict with local communities. We've learned a lot of lessons over the years about how um, how best do they, we can integrate them, even if it's just for a short term. 
um, because obviously there can be animosity grows up between local communities and those seeking asylum if, you know, because of, you know, lack of perhaps understanding of some of the customs and challenges that, that both sets face. Yeah. So um, it's just to give you a little bit of reassurance. We, we, we play our part in that, along with a number of key partners in, in the Falkirk area. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that, Alan. Um, thanks very much, guys, for coming along today. We really got a lot of information out of you today, and we really appreciate that. Um, we're going to close now because we're running to the end of our time. And thanks, everybody, for coming along, and we'll speak to you all later.